Kia ora, uh, Bulavanaka, and welcome everybody to this workshop on environmental human rights defenders in the Pacific region, strengthening environmental and human rights protection. Uh, this uh, workshop is brought to you by the uh, United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Regional Office uh, in the Pacific and the United Nations Environment Programme. My name is Catherine Murupainga Aiken. I'm a Senior Indigenous and Minorities Fellow with the OHCHR Regional Pacific Office and uh, I'll be your moderator for this opening session. So just before we begin, uh, a few housekeeping announcements. So these sessions will be videoed um, and also we will be operating under the Chatham House rules, which means that participants are free to use the information uh, received from these discussions, but neither the identity of the individuals uh, concerned or the affiliation um, of the speakers to any organization and such. Um, neither of uh, those uh, kinds of information may be shared. Um, but aside from that, uh, please feel free to uh, enjoy the workshop and we will begin by introducing our first speaker, um, Ms. Heike Ellefson, Regional Representative from the OHCHR Pacific Regional Office. Um, Ms. Ellefson has almost 30 years of human rights, legal, political and development work experience with the United Nations, the Council of Europe and Human Rights Civil Society. She has worked in the Asia and Pacific region for the past 10 years and took over the OHCHR regional representative position in October last year. So Heike, the floor is yours, welcome. Thank you, Catherine, and uh, good morning, Bula from uh, Fiji, and um, good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, Regional Office here in the Pacific to this workshop. Um, I'd like to thank uh, UNEP uh, and its regional office based in Samoa for the collaboration in organizing this event. The world, including Fiji, is currently battling the pandemic, and this is taking a very heavy toll, not only on the physical and mental health of individuals, but also on societies at large and obviously on their economies. But we are seeing that there is a similar sense of urgency in the climate crisis with very dire consequences if, if business is uh, continuing as usual. The unsettling truth is, in fact, that the impact of the climate crisis is felt disproportionately by many small islands in the Pacific, which experience these threats directly and indirectly through rising sea levels, stronger and more frequent cyclones, and other extreme weather events, deteriorating marine ecosystems, and changes in agriculture and food systems. This region will feel the direct impact of the burning of fossil fuels, despite the Pacific having a low carbon footprint. The climate emergency threatens the full and uh, effective enjoyment of a range of human rights, um, just to name a few, water and sanitation, food, housing, self-determination, culture, as well as a myriad of other rights. Climate-induced displacement, for example, poses a threat to communities, especially in low-lying atolls and in small islands, which increases the risk to lives, to livelihoods, as well as to culture and traditions. In this context, environmental human rights defenders play a crucial role. They protect and promote those rights and the environment that we rely on. They, and in fact many of you, participants in this meeting, are at the front lines of advocating for the responsible management of the environment and natural resources, and for strong environmental rule of law and accountability of duty bearers, most of uh, whom obviously are in government. The right to a healthy environment, which has yet to be fully recognized, 
entails the effective protection and promotion of the rights of people who are standing up for this right. One of the prerequisites for the full protection of the rights of environmental human rights defenders is ensuring access to information, to justice and to participation in decision making in environmental matters. But a major concern which has been highlighted by environmental human rights defenders in the Pacific that our office has been engaging with has been the issue of consent and that meaningful consultation and participation of communities and individuals has been insufficient. This results in local communities feeling neglected, leaving them vulnerable to unscrupulous businesses and creating discontent within the communities. The disproportionate impact of the climate crisis is also heightened for groups that face multiple vulnerabilities. In the community of environmental human rights defenders, we see this happening to women, indigenous peoples, youth, children, persons with disabilities and LGBTIQ environmental human rights defenders who face additional challenges in their work as they have specific risks, including gender-based violence, stigmatization, prejudice, and in some cases, threats to livelihood and lives. <clears throat> we should highlight here that women in the Pacific suffer the highest rate of gender-based violence in the world, apart from Southeast Asia, and this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 restrictions. They are often subjected to cultural norms that impede their work in speaking up for the protection of biodiversity, the environment, and human rights. Of concern to our office has been shrinking space in the Pacific region. Freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association are key elements that human rights defenders in the region, <coughs> excuse me, in the region require, especially during times of the pandemic. The COVID-19 restrictions have, however, reduced space for monitoring of human rights at a time when online and offline space for human rights defenders, especially for environmental human rights defenders, is particularly important. But we're, only, we're not only here to flag concerns. Our regional office um, has engaged with human rights defenders, and we have also heard very concrete recommendations on the way forward. Firstly, transparency. Transparency along the entire chain of environmental decision making is crucial with free prior and informed consent, which is at the core in, of engagement within uh, communities and with the man, environmental human rights defenders and leads to successful outcomes. Secondly, systematic data collection and use and protective legislation in line with the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders is key and it is crucial because it is a long-term sustainable protective mechanism for human rights defenders. The policies and the laws must be in place not only to protect these defenders from threats, but also to ensure an enabling environment more broadly for human rights. And thirdly, intergenerational responsibility must be at the center of strengthening environmental and human rights protection. Protecting and preserving the environment to um, for present and future generations and calling upon the expertise of older generations will create alliances that will strengthen the role of environmental human rights defender, defenders and give much needed recognition and support to children and youth defenders, many of whom are at the forefront of activism. So we look forward to the discussions in that specific session in our workshop, um, which will create space for engagement and leadership of young defenders. And last, but certainly not least, a strong network among environmental human rights defenders and its partners in other sectors is key to sharing the practices and taking a human rights-based, inclusive and gender-sensitive holistic approach to identifying and recording issues which are related to environmental human rights defenders and environmental rights. We are taking another important step in strengthening this network and the various alliances with this workshop. So with this, these few reflections, I wish everyone a very fruitful two days of knowledge sharing and vibrant discussions. And we look forward to the outcome and recommendations which will guide us in our future programs, 
in our future collaboration with you in the fight against the climate crisis and in protecting human rights defenders, in particular environmental human rights defenders. Once again, thank you to everyone for choosing to participate in this event. And thank you to those in my office who made this possible to UNEP for our partnership. And thank you for your attention. Over to you, Catherine. Kia ora, thank you very much, Heike. I was um, interested to hear you reinforce that the right to a healthy environment has yet to be fully recognized and this is something very important that we need to as a pacific but also throughout the world we need to um, mainstream uh, the recognition of that right and and make sure it's fully recognized and also of course uh, that intergenerational responsibility amongst defenders again very critical um, and I, I love the fact that you gave that shout out to children and youth who are at the front lines, as you say. So thank you very much for those remarks. And I uh, would now like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Sefania Nawandra, head of the UNEP Pacific Office um, and his assumed responsibilities um, in that position uh, at the sub-regional office for the Pacific. Um, he took that on in 2015 with over 20 years of experience in the regional environment sector. Mr. Nawandra leads the work of UNEP in 14 Pacific Island countries under five strategic priorities. Uh, so with that introduction, um, Sefania, we'd like to hand the floor over to you. Kia ora. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Heike. Um, Talofa from Samoa, and uh, we here are also thinking about our colleagues and families in Fiji. Uh, we have two staff there, and uh, we try and talk to them every day to see what they're doing. So we're thinking about you. Um, UNEP uh, recognizes the fundamental role that environmental human rights defenders play in the in upholding and implementing and advancing the environmental rule of law. The UN defines environmental human rights defenders as individuals or groups who in their personal or professional capacity and in a peaceful manner strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment, including air, land and fauna. UNEP has been working on human rights and the environment for over two decades now. In March 2018, UNEP launched its environmental rights initiative at the 37th session of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. The initiative works to bring environmental protection nearer to the people by assisting state and non-state actors to promote, protect and reflect and respect environmental rights. The initiative provides support to environmental defenders who strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment. Heike mentioned that we are facing a crisis in climate change. In recent years, over the last uh, year or two, UNEP has been uh, highlighting that we in fact face environmental global crisis, not only in climate change, but also in waste management and the loss of our biodiversity and uh, natural ecosystems. The 2019 UN Human Rights Council unanimously adopted a strong consensus resolution recognizing the contribution of environmental human rights defenders to the enjoyment of human rights environmental protection and sustainable development. They have a vital role to play in stewarding the environment and in supporting governments to achieve the 2030 sustainable development goals and globally agreed environmental commitments such as the Samoa pathway. 
However, UNEP recognizes that the environment human rights defenders are increasingly under threat for their work to protect the environment and ad advocate for the sustainable and equitable use of natural resources. More work needs to be done to not only uphold environmental human rights, but also protect those activists who advocate for these rights. Environmental rights are human rights. There are many environmental rights, including a right to a healthy environment, as well as rights to access natural resources, rights to participate in decision-making regarding the environment, and rights to food and safe drinking water. These rights are inherent to all human beings, and upholding these rights are one of the central pillars of the United Nations. The UNEP uh, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific works closely with partners to protect, promote, and respect environmental rights and support environmental defenders. This workshop advances the collaboration between UNEP and OHCHR in the Pacific. It builds upon the cooperation agreement signed by UNEP and OHCHR in August 2019. The agreement and our discussions during the workshop will further strengthen cooperation and prioritize efforts within our UN entities to promote and protect environmental and human rights. Before I finish, um, maybe just let me share some personal reflections on environmental human rights. Human rights. When I was a student in Canberra in the early 1980s, I bumped into a guy who was a, a military officer studying at the in Potsi and Duntroon in Canberra. This guy was from Papua New Guinea. His name was Sam Kawana. And in uh, a lot of our sessions at the bar, he kept on raising the issue of uh, mining in his home island of Bougainville and how this impacted uh, on the communities in the loss of uh, safe drinking water, loss of forests, and that they were not getting any share of the benefits that were coming out of the mining operation. This same, same uh, Sam Kawana became the leader of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. And uh, unfortunately had to resort to violence, but he was one you could consider also a defender of human rights of his people. And uh, I think he is running for political office uh, right now. Um, that was one of my first uh, encounters with somebody who was an uh, uh, environmental human rights defender for his people. In my 20 years of work around the region, every time I go to the Solomon Islands, uh, what hits me is, uh, is the level of uh, loss in the forests. There's a lot of uh, focus on illegal and unregulated uh, fisheries, but not as much on illegal and unregulated uh, logging. The logging in those areas are often carried out in remote locations. Nobody has any clear idea how much is taken out. The communities are left to fend for themselves in negotiations with the, with the um, operators and also with the uh, government officials. Uh, in 2019, I was asked to go to Renault in Solomon Islands to help them with a, a shipwreck, um, a bauxite carrier that had uh, had beached on one of the beaches there. And it was shocking the operations that were happening on that island. And uh, a quarter of that island is a world heritage area. So you had uh, wide scale 24 hour unregulated mining and logging happening on an island that uh, also contained a World Heritage Site. So there were big challenges for the communities in Renault to try and make uh, 
or safeguard their heritage. Um, and in uh, Fiji, in 2016 to 29, 2006 to 2012, I worked for um, NGO, Conservation International. And um, we set up the Sovi Basin Conservation Area, which is the largest uh, forest protected area in Fiji, 20,000 hectares. But right uh, next to it and conjoining some of the area, was an area that was earmarked for mining. Uh, what was uh, one of the most uh, rewarding things out of that experience was that the landowners themselves turned down all the benefits they could have gotten from mining because they recognized it was better for them to keep this as a protected area that they could uh, get not as much benefit from uh, mon in monetary terms but was better for them in terms of food security and the overall well-being of the community. I look forward to our dialogue during this workshop. And I also look forward to other reflections that other people may have, because I think it's the exchange of things that we experience during our various uh, um, work in different areas that will be the most benefit in um, running a workshop such as this. Thank you. Kia ora Stephania. Um, thank you very much for your personal reflections uh, and uh, we'll, we'll observe over the course of the next two days reoccurring themes. Um, of course one that's already been mentioned twice is a climate crisis and the convergence um, of this crisis and others and secondly the, a reoccurring theme is uh, the business um, and industry sector. And I'm sure um, we will talk more about the different uh, aspects of business and industry that can be improved in terms of um, the uh, protections for environmental human rights defenders um, with regards to mining. Uh, you mentioned logging and fisheries as well, the shipping sector even. So um, I look forward to uh, our further discussions um, with respect to that component of protections. So thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, our speaker, um, and this will be by video recording, um, is our next speaker, Ms. Mary Lawler, Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders, uh, was unable to join us at this time due to uh, time differences. Um, Ms. Lawler took up the mandate of Special Rapporteur on the 1st of May and is currently an adjunct professor of business and human rights in the Centre for Social Innovation at the School of Business at Trinity College in Dublin. She's a member of the advisory board of the School of Business and has worked extensively with and on the situation of human rights defenders. And uh, Ms. Lawler had a, a key role in the development of Frontline Defenders, um, an international foundation for the protection of human rights defenders, uh, being the executive director from 2001 to 2016. Uh, so with that, I will invite our technician to begin the video. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you in this way today. Although we're used at this stage to doing these video messages and calls, it's still very frustrating not to be able to travel. I'm hoping that when I can travel, we might be able to meet. And I'm conscious that in the past, the Pacific region hasn't had as much attention from this mandate as other places. The issue of protecting environmental human rights defenders is one of the priorities I set out for myself when I started this role a year ago. We know that it is among the most dangerous work that defenders do. My last report to the Human Rights Council was on the killings of human rights defenders worldwide and the threats that often precede them. And it is detailed how environmental human rights defenders are the most targeted, the most likely to be murdered worldwide since 2015. 
The report shows how human rights defenders have been killed in 64 states, including in the Pacific, since 2015. That's a third of all UN member states. I find that shocking. And those who defend environmental rights in the Pacific area often are targeted in other ways by being smeared and vilified and de delegitimized and criminalized. They also experience social stigma and other types of attacks for defending the environment. Terrible though all this targeting is, there is a growing recognition that environmental human rights defenders need special protection. I am heartened by the establishment in Latin America and the Caribbean of the Escazú Agreement. It is an important milestone. The first binding instrument that includes specific provisions for the protection and promotion of environmental human rights defenders. It obliges states to guarantee an enabling environment for the work of defenders working on environmental issues. I hope other regions will learn from this example and address this issue of environmental human rights defenders being at particular risk, often from both governments and business. They require particular protections and I hope too that the environmental defenders policy currently under review by the UNEP will continue to be a practical tool for defenders to use when they're at risk. I know that some NGOs have expressed concern about it being watered down and I really hope this doesn't happen. It is vital that states, companies, UN offices and others all do whatever they can to protect environmental defenders in the Pacific and elsewhere. While my mandate has limits on what I can do, I can and will continue to raise cases in public and private of environmental human rights defenders who are being targeted for what they do. In some cases to women defenders working on environmental issues are also targeted not only for who they are and not only for the human rights work that they do. Thank you very much again and I look forward to hearing about your discussions and hopefully see you at some point. Uh, we thank uh, Ms Lola for her recorded message um, and very uh, poignant reminder about the most dangerous work that our environmental human rights defenders do do. It's uh, often something that happens in an invisible way um, every day they're conducting their work but it's not always seen by the wider civil society, let alone appreciated. So we need to really remind ourselves that um, they do put themselves at huge risk when they um, undertake their advocacy work, which will benefit all of us. So um, thank you very much to Ms. Lola once again. Uh, our next speaker is um, Ms. Sinai Bukalindi, a Research and Policy Support Officer at the Pacific Islands Association of Non-Governmental Organizations, or PIANGO. And uh, Ms. Bukalindi has uh, assisted PIANGO's National Liaison Units and its young leaders in ensuring that they find a common platform of advocacy. She's been working in the civil society organization sector for seven years in local communities in Fiji, and in the wider region. So uh, Senai, we welcome you. Thank you very much for joining us and hand the mic to you, Kia ora. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for that introduction. Um, so before I begin, um, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of my island home, the people of uh, Lavoni on the island of Ovalau and the custodians of Fiji. I pay my respects to my elders, past, present and future and to all indigenous peoples and peoples who continue to fight to protect our mana. Nadango Seni Kordevan Bukalindi, Awonela Nivisota Malavoni Ovalau, Nungutoka Toko Vudilevu, Nungu Matanga Leotori, Nungu Evu Solovoni, Nungu Ikanavo, Nungu Kau, Namakosoi, Nungu Tutu Vavano Naturanga, 
loosely translated that introduction in my dialect is my identity that introduction is my mana recognizing my identity my mana my culture and tradition is what keeps the fire burning it keeps me from continuing uh, to fight and be the voice of the voiceless climate related disasters such as uh, tropical cyclones floods and droughts are not new to pacific islanders who have developed customary or traditional practices to enable our communities rather to adapt and recover from such disasters some of these practices have been degraded and some assisted by more assisted rather by modernization um, through the effects on the island environment these hazards have a range of socioeconomic impacts on food fisheries and crops and water supply tourism and coastal buildings and infrastructure the very impacts of climate change not only exacerbates these hazards but also raises new threats such as sea level rise and ocean acidification for which there are no traditional adaptations although pacific rather innate ingenuity and resilience remains strong these issues are particularly acute for the low-lying and tall countries whose continued existence is threatened by sea level rise but also affect those that live on higher islands and coastal settlements where most of their population is concentrated climate change thus sharpens social and cultural issues of equity rather reflecting disparities in location income education gender health and age made even more acute by increased levels of voluntary or forced migration within and even more so beyond island country boundaries this is particularly true in the case of Fiji and Kiribati. For over 30 years, Fiango has served the Pacific through strengthening and building the capacity of NGOs and the civil society sector through giving the sector a voice in policy formulation and strengthening its member umbrella bodies in the 24 Pacific countries and territories we work with. Fiango's primary role is to be a catalyst for collective action, to facilitate and support coalitions and alliances on issues of common concern and to strengthen the influence and impact of NGO efforts in the region. Our network, network of national umbrella organizations across the 24 countries continues to work towards supporting enabling environments to their membership at the national level. We continue to give the sector a voice to policy formulation and development and strengthening of our NLUs or the umbrella organizations rather the 24 member countries of the Pacific. With its membership network spread across the biggest ocean of the world, this has brought many challenges, including the high cost of transportation, limited accessibility to communication systems, and a weak interest by development partners to support civil society work both at national and regional level. It further demonstrates the lack of understanding of the role and contribution of civil society to extend and make services accessible to the poor and marginalized sector of our society. This is, of course, one of the main challenges that some of our NLUs face. Uh, Kiribati, for example, being one of our NLUs uh, that is a living and breathing paradigm through the set experience, are witnessing the very impacts of climate change, which are visible as we have even recognized climate-induced tourism. However, despite this, there are people who still do not wish to relocate. Their Kiribati identity is priceless to them and their attitude of patriotism is important to them as well. It is strongly believed that the ancestral motherland will not change. Everyone believes that the climate crisis is a reality. Unfortunately, the climate crisis has not only affected the environment, but also violated the personal spaces of people and families. This has resulted in family disputes and domestic violence. The youth feel insecure about their parents' relationships, and the women are worried about having broken families because of the impacts of climate change. The education of children have also been affected by these impacts. There are people who question the scenario of relocation, and there are those that have not thought of relocating rather. On the other hand, there are those that have chosen to learn from the experiences of others and become proactive instead. 
they would rather prepare themselves now instead of waiting for the next disaster to strike. Which brings me to my, mo to my most important point, which is one of our biggest challenges, that is the need for due diligence between governments and the people with regards to policies and their rights related to climate change and preserving their environment. A knowledge gap exists in this space, which calls for urgent attention. To ensure that the voices of the people and communities are not ignored, Tiango with Kango launched the Kiribati Voices for Dignity and Resilience, um, KV4DR project, which was launched in 2018. It focuses on ensuring that Kiribati communities are safeguarded from climate-induced displacement, ensuring their safety, security, and dignity in adaptation and long-term resilience. The project is about the voice and promotion of choice. A key output of the project was a baseline survey and community voices on climate-induced displacement. The members of Kango were commissioned to undertake community consultations within the framework of the project in selected study sites. The work conducted in Kiribati would eventually assist Kiango and Kango in increasing the voices of Kiribati communities at which policy spaces. This will also ensure rather that policies are shaped to reflect the needs, priorities and voices of the Kiribati communities. And the threat and impacts of climate change is not a myth or a theory, but a reality instead. This is proven by what is visible in communities and islands. Now, these impacts include climate-induced displacement, a process that has already taken place in Kiribati and would continue to as the threat of climate change increases. Climate-induced displacement, though seen as a support mechanism by some, has also aroused emotions. It has made people sad and have instilled fear in them. To conclude, the people are eager for a more meaningful consultation on policies and rights concerning their welfare in the midst of the climate crisis. There is a belief among some people that they will benefit from these policies and the people are reliant on the government and other stakeholders for support. As the gaps are pretty evident, being the tool to bridge that gap is currently a luxury, which only, which quickly needs to be prioritized to safeguard and ensure that no one is left behind. Um, Catherine, if I may, I'd just like to share a, a personal reflection. Uh, this is just to add on to um, what my colleague, Mr. Nawandra, had earlier um, alluded to. He had talked about Bougainville. Um, I've been to Bougainville. I've, I've seen the struggles that the people have gone through. Uh, as an activist, I've been held at gunpoint. I've even been um, cut uh, down from the Panguna mines, um, only to be held at the Arawa for about two weeks. Um, we've been hauled into police vehicles as well because of um, the work that we do as activists. But all in all, it is all well. Um, as I've said, we are here to be the voice of the voiceless. Kia ora, thank you very much, Sini. I, um, again, very much appreciate uh, your sharing of uh, insights and um, spotlighting the work of Piango, which is really critical in this region where, as you rightly point out, um, we face our particular challenges in NGO networking and collaborative efforts um, and strengthening voices and policy making and, and so on. Um, and the point about forced migration, um, especially of our low-lying Pacific states is really important because it does present the uh, question around how different uh, peoples in our region wish to exercise their own um, particular uh, notion of self-determination, whether they um, are proactive in uh, migrating or whether they decide to actually um, look at all of the solutions that might be available to them so they can remain as long as possible in their homelands and territories. So it's uh, very difficult when facing climate crisis, um, the decision making for every community affected is uh, very important. So. Thank you very much for that. And, and I note that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is working with other UN agencies on encouraging our regional Pacific leaders to um, adopt a joint framework uh, for climate change induced uh, migration. 
So uh, we look forward to sharing more information from the office about that. So kia ora again, thank you very much. Our next uh, speaker, our final speaker for the session is Ms. Kamal Narayan, a climate activist and member of Alliance for Future Generations, Fiji. Um, Ms. Narayan is a climate activist and ocean advocate from Fiji, who is also of the Pacific Island uh, representative for the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. And this year, she's part of the official 16th conference of youth team as the country coordinator for Fiji. She's participated in many youth-led events and international climate change conferences. So uh, Kamal, thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing your intervention. Kia ora. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, before I start, um, you know, a big thank you for the um, office of the human uh, office of the high commissioner for human rights Pacific office for this opportunity and for organizing this workshop indeed and I hope it, and I know that this will be a great learning experience uh, you know specific, especially for the young people as well learning from each other and the experiences that we have to share and uh, as uh, well I guess Catherine has already introduced and uh, I am also part of the Alliance for Future Generations Network, which is a young people-led network for sustainable development. And, you know, we heavily focus on uh, issues around climate justice, human rights, health, oceans, gender. So, yeah, that's, that's about the group that I'm a part of. And uh, allow, allow me to start proper. So, did you know that a record 212 environmental activists were killed in 2019? This is an average of more than four deaths per week, according to a new report from the environmental NGO Global Witness. A recent report from Frontline Defenders revealed that in 2020 alone, at least 331 environmental defenders were killed globally. The majority of these deaths were among people who worked in the defense of land and environmental rights and rights of indigenous people. Environmental human rights defenders are individuals and groups who strive to protect and promote human rights relating to the environment. And they are from many different backgrounds. Some are lawyers or journalists. Many, many of them are ordinary people living in remote villages, forests or mountains who may not even be aware that they are acting as environmental human rights defenders. In many cases, they are representatives of indigenous peoples and traditional communities whose lands and ways of life are threatened by large corporate projects or any activity that is harming our environment negatively. What they all have in common is that they work to protect the environment on which a vast range of human rights depend. Ideally, these environmental defenders should be able to exercise their human rights of freedom of expression and association to information, to participation in decision-making and to effective remedies to help protect the environment and the rights that depend upon it from unsustainable exploitation. In this way, the relationship between human rights and the environment should be a virtuous circle. The exercise of human rights to help protect the environment and a healthy environment helps to ensure the full enjoyment of human rights. Across the Pacific region, human rights defenders regularly experience harassment and violence threats from their community and their advocacy targets, and arrests by the authorities. In some countries, laws limit the work of human rights defenders by restricting their right to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. States abuse legal provisions to prosecute them. In most of the region, there are no laws that explicitly protect and promote the rights of human rights defenders. In the last decade, violence against environmental defenders has received increased international attention. However, much work is still necessary to be able to develop gender responsive safeguards and response mechanisms as incidents of gender-based violence against women environmental defenders that are on the rise as well, reinforcing gender inequality in public and private spheres. Gender-based violence is disproportionately used against women environmental human rights defenders to control and silence them and suppress their power and authority as leaders. Impunity dominates the violence faced by environmental defenders, particularly violence against indigenous defenders, 
and for women environmental defenders in societies where gender-based discrimination and violence are socially normalized or permissible. Indigenous women in particular face disproportionate criminalization and state-sanctioned violence. You know, we all want to be able to breathe clean air, drink safe water, and to be able to provide sustenance and a healthy, dignified life for our families. Human survival and well being rests on a biodiverse and healthy environment and a safe climate. Environmental human rights defenders help us to achieve that. Their work is essential to attaining the sustainable development goals and ensuring that no one is truly left behind. To, expedi to expeditiously achieve the SDGs by 2030, it is important that we support environmental defenders because they create the groundswell required to get all stakeholders involved in environmental stewardship conservation and protection. We need to ingrain environmental stewardship into law and order, and more importantly, using national environmental laws to give protection to legal activists and ensure that they are heard and their rights are protected. We also need to be able to increase education, awareness raising efforts, research and data collection on the gender differentiated violence and discrimination against women, indigenous, young and LGBTQI plus defenders. We need to support the campaigns of women environmental defenders and young defenders by providing spaces and visibility to their global clamors for justice, including to build awareness and mobilize resources and support. And in, in, this, world of the COVID, in this world of COVID pandemic that all the countries are facing at the moment, we, we know that you know, gender-based violence are on the rise and lives of many people are at stake as well. So we, need, we should be able to provide a safe space, a safe community, a peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity for the, um, not just the environmental defenders, but you know, women environmental defenders to be specific and the youths who are the future generations of tomorrow so that they are able to continue the work, the advocacy work that they're doing. Thank you. Kia ora, Kamal, thank you very much for um, your intervention and highlighting uh, the gender-based violence um, aspect of environmental human rights defense work um, and also the fact that the sustainable development goals uh, to achieve them will require um, environmental human rights defenders to um, be enabled to freely do their important work and do it effectively. And that means, of course, um, protecting their human rights. So it all comes back in full circle to the same message um, that we must repeat apparently again and again to uh, change the culture that you also um, mentioned in, in terms of uh, the violence normalized against uh, women in particular. And that's that's quite um, a, a, a very difficult challenge ahead for us because culture is so ingrained in societies, right? So it's got a lot of momentum, um, and to disrupt that momentum and improve it, uh, it will take some uh, further coordinated effort. So I look forward to um, hearing our thoughts about how that might be achieved. So thanks again for joining us for our opening session and.